Foreign News correspondent Paul Davis reports. Many of those who had followed Nelson Mandela through the revolutionary days were waiting outside the ANC conference centre to salute the man who has decided it's time to step down as party leader. For Nelson Mandela, this was an emotional day, but one he's been planning for some time. His party's 50th national conference chosen as the appropriate time to pass on the baton. This is going to be the last opportunity for me to attend in this capacity. Before handing over to his successor, Thabo Mbeki, he looked back at the ANC's greatest achievement under his own leadership. The principal result of our revolution, the displacement of the apartheid political order by a democratic system, has become an established fact of South African society. Nelson Mandela left the conference with the message there was still work to do, in particular the building of greater understanding between the races. His supporters, even his former wife Winnie, joined in saluting him. Having passed on the party leadership, Nelson Mandela will step down as president in 1999. Facing life without Mandela at the helm may be the new South Africa's greatest test. Paul Davis, ITN. Coming up in the programme, new fears about the so-called chicken flu virus. Could it be the start of a global epidemic? And a report from Cape Town on the problems facing the hospital which saw the world's first heart transplant. Before that, graphic first-hand accounts of diseases suffered by smokers are being used in the latest campaign to deter young people from taking up cigarettes. Two of the people appearing in new advertisements are in their 30s. One has cancer of the lung and brain. The campaign coincides with research showing teenagers think far more people smoke than is actually the case. Here's our health correspondent, Penny Marshall. The makers of today's advert are unashamed about their intention to shock, to prevent young people from smoking. The campaign features real patients and doctors from this London hospital who know only too well the tragedies smoking can cause. <coughs> The two and a half million pound campaign of hard-hitting commercials features graphic examples of suffering. There are about two million smokers in the 16 to 24 year old age group and we're confident um, in estimating that up to a million, million of them will die prematurely because of their smoking. So we really do need to help them and give them the opportunities and the motivation to quit now. The statistics relating to smoking are chilling. 121,000 deaths are caused by smoking in the UK every year. That's 330 each day. In fact, nearly a fifth of all deaths in this country are attributable to smoking. The cost of treating these patients on the NHS is enormous, as is the cost in human suffering. For these elderly patients, many of whom suffer from smoking-related diseases, the warnings have come too late. It's hoped their words will jolt today's youth into action. It's, it's not easy to give up smoking. <coughs> But it's very hard to, to avoid it. But uh, if, if I knew the damage that it did when I was 16, 17, there is no way that I'd go through this. It's hell. The adverts will run from Boxing Day right through till March. They'll be accompanied by press and radio messages and a 24-hour helpline for those youngsters who feel the need to quit. Penny Marshall, ITN, at the Brompton Hospital. Fears about so-called chicken flu, a virus that's killed two people in Hong Kong, were heightened today when an expert in infectious diseases said it could turn into a global epidemic. The virus originated in chickens and has spread to humans. So far, it's shown no sign of being spread from one person to another, but it is increasing at an alarming rate, as our Asia correspondent Mark Austin reports from Hong Kong. It's chickens from southern China, which are thought to be the source of the new deadly strain of flu. For months, scientists here have been frantically trying to determine whether the virus can be transmitted from human to human. Today, at a news conference, the government admitted for a first time such transmission was likely. It's a very prominent possibility. I mean, I, you know, I think that, like everybody else, when we hear about more cases, it, it just um, increases our concern and increases our, um, our worry about that. As poultry markets here are closed for intensive cleanups, scientists say they believe the low number of cases so far indicate a weak virus, but that could change. 
And there is a possibility that this virus could, could become stronger in terms of its efficiency. Well, by stronger, you mean it could become more adapted to Efficient, humans and sort of yeah. pass through. Yeah. Yes, there is that possibility. And even if the worst fears are confirmed, the authorities believe a worldwide epidemic like that in 1968, which killed 700,000 people, will be avoided. They've identified the virus early, and vaccines can be prepared. But we need to work very hard and very quickly to get to understand this virus more. Tonight, the government announced a series of measures to improve monitoring and surveillance, including the setting up of special clinics designed to take thousands of swabs every day. Public anxiety is inevitably increasing here, but the message from the government is, stay calm. We're one step ahead. Mark Austin, ITN, Hong Kong. Now more of the day's news. First, the trial following the death of the racing driver Ayrton Senna is due to end today. The judge will deliver his verdict on Frank Williams and two other members of his Formula One team who are facing manslaughter charges. The prosecution's recommending that the charges against Mr Williams be dropped. French accident investigators have admitted they're now unlikely to find the Fiat Uno thought to have been involved in the crash which killed Diana, Princess of Wales. It's thought the French magistrate leading the investigation may close the case early in the new year. And Richard Branson's stranded balloon is due to be retrieved by the RAF today. A Hercules crew will pick up the damaged canopy from Algeria and then fly it to Morocco for an inspection. The rescue flight is being paid for by Mr Branson. Much of the country is shivering its way through the coldest day of the winter so far as bitter Siberian winds sweep in from the east. So it's an appropriate time for Age Concern and the British Medical Association to begin their Good Neighbour campaign. They want us all to check that elderly neighbours have enough food and warmth during the cold snaps. John Taylor reports. Simon Nixon is something of a one-off. Every day for the past four years, the 13-year-old has played the good neighbour to pensioner Francis Roberts. Making sure there's plenty of coal for the fire is just one of the many little jobs he does for a widow who relies on the friendly gesture. I do have a struggle if I can't get my coal in and that, you know. And sometimes I have to go if I have to go in the shed. But Simon makes sure I don't have to go in the shed. Nothing is too much trouble for Simon's helping hands. Other youngsters too, he says, ought to give some thought for the needs of the old. If there are people around them then just to just keep an eye on them. They don't have to you know, go into a big thing about it, just make sure that they're all right. You know, if they don't see them about, just go and see if they're all right. Or if it's, if it's cold, if the milk's on the doorstep, just pass it to them or something. Three and a half million pensioners live alone. The, the campaign's organisers said this morning the Good Neighbour scheme could save lives, especially in cold weather. With the cold snap, we have a real health issue. If old people do have to go and get their own shopping or pick up a prescription and slip on a slippery pavement and break a hip, uh, unfortunately the mortality from that is very, very high. Weather forecasters say this cold snap will get worse. Last winter, the cold claimed the lives of 46,000 elderly folk. By tomorrow morning, we'll see some snow pushing up from the south and the west with blizzard conditions over the high ground. Encouraging people to take a leaf out of Simon's book should take the worry out of winter for many of the old. John Taylor, ITN. With us now is Sally Greengross from Age Concern. Sally Greengross, it, this can be a bit of a tricky business, can't it? Some old people can be a bit resentful of even well-meaning concern. How do you get around that? Well, this is a unique approach uh, in which the BMA and Edge Concern have joined forces through their doctor-patient partnership. And the reason it's unique is that uh, a mechanism's been found which I think will be very effective. Hundreds of thousands of cards, greeting cards, are being distributed in GP surgeries and with local Edge Concerns in day centres and clubs. And this is to encourage people, either those who perhaps have been ill, they're frail, and they're at home and they don't really know how to get out in this sort of weather and get a prescription or get the right sort of food to build up a, a little stock if it's very cold. Or for people who live near an elderly person to actually have a way of introducing themselves to So encourage to this both card. sides, so to speak. It's to encourage both sides. And I think the, the, the important thing about this is the health gain. It's going to be really effective, I'm sure, in preventing a lot of excess deaths and certainly a lot of very bad health, now so it's good for the health service too. If somebody is concerned about a neighbour and um, you know suspects they are getting too cold and so on, what should they do next? 
Well, they, the, if it's somebody who doesn't know about this scheme, uh, one way of approaching this is to get in touch with your local age concern. They're all geared up now for the cold weather and have so many calls and needs that they have to meet in the winter, but they're very experienced. And they can signpost you as to where you might be of the most help. It's a very important and a unique scheme which I'm really excited about. Indeed. Sally Greengross, thank you very much. Thank you. Thirty years ago, Dr. Christian Barnard made medical history by performing the world's first successful heart transplant. But now the hospital unit in South Africa which pioneered the operation is facing an uncertain future. As John Irvine reports for today's lunchtime report, the budget is being spent instead on basic health care for the thousands of people still living in poverty. Thirty years ago, Cape Town's Grootschgoor Hospital shocked the world when it announced that the first human heart transplant had been carried out successfully. The operation that was being contemplated in the United States was performed by Dr. Christian Barnard. He is now in his 70s. I'm, I'm very grateful that I was able to live another 30 years after the first transplant. And also I was, uh, I'm very grateful that I was able to see the advances made in this field and uh, to live to the day to when uh, heart transplantation is a very successful operation. And uh, what's more is that the patient who live after the operation live a very a, a virtual normal life. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy with the progress that's been made in the 30 years since the first transplant. To mark the anniversary, a transplant museum has opened in the hospital. Here they have tried to recreate the scene when Barnard and his team transplanted a new heart for Louis Wyshansky. The anniversary celebrations, however, have been tempered by the fact that the transplant unit now faces collapse. Budget cuts and a staff shortage have forced them to turn away new patients. We've transplanted over 400 patients successfully. Um, these patients are dependent upon us for their future care. And we are committed, obviously, despite any cuts that, that happen in the future, to continue caring for those patients who are, who are alive and who are on a waiting list for transplantation. The future really is the, the, the problems that might exist in the future is that we may not be able to take new patients onto our heart transplant program. And that will be, uh, that will be a great um, a sadness at this time that we're about to celebrate 30 years of heart transplant at Rudisky Hospital. Financial resources are now being redirected to parts of South Africa which lack even the most basic health care. In the past, vast amounts of money were spent on high-tech medicine and surgery, while millions of people had no access to rudimentary medical treatment. The regime that financed pioneering surgery 30 years ago was very different from the one that governs South Africa today. History was made at this hospital, but it may have been at the expense of a large neglected portion of the population. John Irvine, ITN, Cape Town. The winning venue for the new